I'm Dr. James Dick from the Mayo Clinic. I'm here with my father, Dr. Peter Dick, also of the Mayo Clinic. And we're going to talk about a review article that Jennifer Tracy and I wrote about history, diagnosis, and management of CIDP, or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy. Now, Dr. Peter Dick is not an author on this paper. However, I think he's the most important person when it comes to CIDP that exists. And the reason for that is that he initially and originally described CIDP in 1975, and that was published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Subsequent to that, he went on to show that prednisone was an effective treatment for CIDP, and then the plasma exchange was an effective treatment for CIDP, and then eventually that intravenous immunoglobulin was an effective treatment for CIDP. So really, he both described this disease, showed what its pathology was, and showed what effective treatments are for CIDP. So it's a real honor for me to have you along today to discuss this illness with us. How did you originally recognize CIDP? I began to be referred patients with other kinds of neuropathy. And one of the groups of cases I saw were chronic neuropathies which had unique features. Uh, typically, they, were, they involved all four limbs. They were severe. Uh, they had a very distinctive abnormality of nerve conduction. Their conduction velocities were low and they were dispersed. We began to biopsy these nerves and found that there was segmental demyelination and inflammation. So I began to think of them as a chronic variety of a, an inflammatory neuropathy. And so by 1975, I decided to pull these cases together. So I thought it, it, we should separate out the groups, the group of patients that were like Guillain-Barre, but weren't Guillain-Barre. They were different in having a, a different uh, course uh, findings, neurophysiological features and pathology. Also, we began to be able to do post-mortem studies on a few cases and found that they had combinations of demyelination and remyelination, inflammatory infiltrates, uh, and it was a patchy involvement. So the idea grew in my mind that there were the, this distinctive group of chronic inflammatory demyelinating cases that had a broad distribution affecting nerve roots to different parts of the peripheral nerve and that maybe an, an appropriate designation would be chronic inflammatory demyelinating uh, polyradicular neuropathy. So in our report that you I think alluded to in 1975 I think we had 53 cases. 53 cases that you'd followed for more than seven years on average. That, that's right. And some of them we'd done postmortems on, and we thought that they did respond to prednisone. So we thought it was worthwhile to set this group of cases apart and, and treat them. And we found the pathological changes in the nerve roots and in proximal nerves extending to them. For example, in the paper, we have a, a striking picture of a proximal nerve which has large fields of onion bulbs, uh, evidence of D and remyelination, adjacent to a large mononuclear cell infiltrate. That's taken from a proximal nerve? From a proximal sciatic nerve. And then uh, in another field, you see just the onion bulbs. So clearly, uh, this was a disseminated process affecting, uh, in the patchy manner, different regions of, of nerve roots, uh, segmental nerves, the plexuses, and then the peripheral nerves. You went on to treat a lot of these people, and you just didn't give them therapeutic trials. You actually did control clinical trials. In the case of immunoglobulin, the, the results were really astounding because the patients who received the immunoglobulin improved remarkably. 
by an, uh, we, by a tool we had introduced called the NIS, or as people now call it, the NIS. But the NIS is simply an adding up of neurological impairments from examination of muscle weakness, reflexes, uh, and sensation. And during the treatment of rhythmian globulin, they improved dramatically. During the wash-up period, they began to worsen again. And so we had numeric uh, values for that worsening and the improvement. So the NIS so stands can, for... And you can subject it to a statistical analysis. The NIS stands for the Neuropathy Impairment Score? Yes. And that's the study in which you compare plasma exchange to intravenous immunoglobulin? Yes, as an example. Um, do you think uh, plasma exchange or intravenous immunoglobulin works better for CIDP? Does one work better than the other? Which, which are you comparing, IVIG versus what? Plasma exchange. Oh, plasma exchange. We thought they were equivalent, but clearly IVIG was, in some respects, much simpler. You didn't have the patient, this could be done in the home. Uh, you didn't need the big apparatus. Uh, they seem to be roughly equivalent, actually, in, in terms of efficacy. Uh, clearly better, though, than prednisone. In your view? A lot of the world well, uses prednisone still. They do, but I think the, uh, the evidence is clearly uh, shows that IVIG or plasma exchange are more efficacious. A lot of people now think that IVIG works well, but it isn't the answer because you need ongoing treatment potentially forever. What's your views on that? Is there uh, much hope on the horizon? That I don't know. The, it is clear that you need to tailor make the, the dosage and the frequency of the plasma exchange or the IVIG to the needs of the patient. In my view, that isn't done carefully enough by most people. Well, I think we could talk all day long here, but I, that's a little overview of CIDP. The article that we wrote is really a review article about what's happening in CIDP, but an awful lot of it emphasizes the career of Dr. Peter Dick and the work of Dr. Peter Dick. And I think it's exciting for me to write this review article in Mayo Clinic Proceedings when the very original paper describing CIDP was published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Thank so you. I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.